Hello, 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 and welcome back to another video on this channel. It's Sunday, it's a great day, and we are, like always every Sunday, going to be doing another debate review. And the debate review in this video is actually recommended by you guys, the audience, on my Discord server to, and one of you guys asked me, to review the Josh Rasmussen versus Alex Malpass debate, or actually it was more like a discussion on Majesty of Reason's channel. So before I get into any of the discussion in this channel, I'd like to just give a quick shout out to the guys who tell me and give me feedback on my Discord server. So if you want to give me any feedback about anything, or also just request videos about literally anything, I'll be happy to check them out and make videos for you. So you can join that Discord server in the description below, join the community, help it grow and help improve the channel with helpful feedback and also give me video ideas. If you want me to check anything out, just let me know over there or in the comments below if you do not have Discord. I know my audience is kind of mixed between some teens to some adults. So, I mean, if you don't have Discord, it's fine. Just let me know in the comments below and I would get back to you and make a video on the suggestions that you have. So, Furthermore, since this video or this discussion was held on Majesty of Reason, I'll just give a quick shout out to Joe Schmidt. Amazing channel, absolutely fantastic guy, apart from the fact he supports Arsenal, of course, but he seems like an absolutely amazing guy. Great channel, great discussions there. So I'll also have his channel and the video link in the description below. So if you want to go check that out and want to watch the entire discussion, make sure you go check it out. So today's video might be a bit long. And the reason for that is because I'd made like eight or nine pages worth of notes about the debate or the discussion and and yeah I mean it it was quite a, a more lengthy and a more profound and insightful discussion so so the notes were a bit longer so I think this video is going to be a bit longer but it doesn't really matter I will I'll go through this as quickly as possible and give you a bas basically quite a good summary and a review of the discussion and sometimes I'm torn between two minds of whether I'm giving a summary or a review but We'll see how that goes. Let me know which one it actually is after you've watched it. But with all this blabbering out of the way, all this admin stuff out of the way, if you want to see my notes, I will scan them and put them on my blog page. Link for that will be in the description below if you want to read my notes. But my handwriting is absolutely horrible there. But, but I've talked enough about this. Let's get into the discussion. So the discussion between Josh and Alex, I'll just call him Josh and Alex because it's just going to take way too long if I call Josh Rasmussen and, and that's just going to take forever. But essentially the discussion was on the, inf the infinitude of the past, more specifically the Grim Reaper's paradox and Alex's idea of the unsatisfiable pair, which I did talk about a bit it, with Zach the other day on his channel and also in response to uh, Rationality Rules' response to Cameron Bertuzzi. So here we have a start off with Josh presenting the Grim Reaper's Paradox, which isn't too new or anything. It's basically the idea of, well, the Grim Reaper Paradox, you raise the hypotheses, you look at the different statements that we've, we is very common for Grim Reaper's Paradox, and then you see with these possible ideas, then it, then you get the conclusion from the, these hypotheses that there's a contradiction. And essentially, what in the case of the Grim Reaper's paradox as a proof by contradiction, you see that, well, let's imagine that there's an infinitely, there's some, there's an infinitely old universe. And then in that infinitely old universe, there is like infinite number of machines and then there's Fred and then there's Bob and then Fred, and then Bob uses the machines to kill Fred. And of course, like normal, the machines follow the Z series or a convergent series towards a certain number. You have an infinite number of machines, which if the, the machine before it didn't kill Fred, then that machine will kill Fred. But then if there was another machine before that machine, which should kill Fred, then that would have killed Fred and Fred would not have been killed at a later date. So essentially, Grim Reaper's paradox says is that at any time there would have been that Fred should be killed, there'll be a machine before that which kills Fred. And hence, you don't at every single time, Fred should be dead, but also should be alive because there's not a single definite machine which kills Fred. But at the same time, Fred has to be dead. Otherwise, he should still be alive. Has to be dead because if he was alive, he would have been killed by a machine. So essentially, you have a contradiction at the end. And now there must be a problem with the argument. And, and then Josh just basically says, well, the best way to get out of this thing or to defeat this paradox is to admit that the temporal chain is indeed finite. So let us turn towards Alex's response, which I think is very interesting here, and it's Alex Malpass and Alex O'Connor, but essentially what Mal uh, Alex says is that it's not it's not explicit that the paradox or the contradiction arises from an actually infinite past, and what he's saying is that, well, 
while it does seem that one of the ways that you could solve the paradox is to say, well, maybe it is the problem of the contradiction comes from the actually infinite partial, the actually causal chain, actually infinite causal chain. That might not be the reason where you get the contradiction from, because perhaps you could say, well, time is dense, and what time is dense means that between every two points in time, there's a time in between that. So, so essentially, you could have an infinitely an infinite amount of points on a finite time. So imagine you have between you have the convergence series, right? You have a convergence series which converges towards a finite area. But there's actually an infinite number numbers on that series. So you could say, well, imagine that's the case. And well, you can actually apply the, the Grim Reaper's paradox to that. And you could say, well, maybe the Grim Reaper at the most demonstrates that time is indeed time is indeed discrete, which is the idea that there's actually minims or there's these fundamental particles in time. Not particles, not the word, but there's fundamental divisions in time that it's not equally dense and and spread out in the sense that you can have an actually infinite number of time in a finite area. So essentially what Alex is saying is that, well, th this is not the only way to solve it, or is not the only conclusion that you could draw from it, that the past is infinite. You could also say, you could also approach by saying, well, the only thing that the Grim Reaper paradox proves is that time is discrete and nothing more. So with that in mind, it seems that in order for the Grim Reaper's paradox to work against an actually infinite time, well, you should also kind of take into consideration the idea that maybe the Grim Reaper mechanisms or these machines only kill Fred in an equally spaced out time. So instead of that being a convergent series, you just have maybe a Fred, the Grim Reaper killing at one and in two and in three and in four and in five. So they're equally spaced out ad infinitum towards the past. So then that might be a better way to approach the issue. And then in response to that, uh, Josh agrees with that in, in some sense. And Josh Wells says is that this, the Grim Reaper paradox, I'm turning on the aircon, it's a bit hot here, but essentially uh, Josh is saying is that the infinite causal chain in the Grim Reaper's paradox does not only need to be one of a convergent series. Instead, you can also have an infinite series in the sense that, well, let's have it equally spread out and the same thing could work because before any series or any machine in that series kills Fred, then there'll always be one more. And it doesn't matter whether it's convergent or whether it's just equally spaced out over an infinite time. There'll always be another machine before the one which you have right now. And that would just produce the same contradictory results at the end. And then, so they continue to talk on and then, and then Alex just stresses the fact that, well, it only demonstrates that time is discrete and it's possible that time is discrete and infinite and says that, well, for any, and this is what the unsatisfiable pair, and I'm, un, the unsatisfiable pair basically is, it says, well, you have two pairs which cannot work together. One pair is that there is a relevant structure with no beginning, and then that is like basically the infinite time or the convergent interval. It could be any finite, I mean, infinite series. And on the other hand, you have, well, the structure, the Grim Reaper structure, or, which is P is true if and only if P is not true. So you have the Grim Reaper's paradox mixed with the infinite time, and you say, well, two of them together leads to a contradiction, but you never know which one's actually wrong. You either have, while well, you know that both can't be right at the same time, perhaps it's a Grim Reaper's paradox which is wrong, you take away the Grim Reaper paradox, and then you're left with infinite time, which is not contradictory. Or you could take away infinite time, and you're left with the Grim Reaper's paradox, so you ha you're torn between these two views. And and Alex is basically saying is that if you have these both at face value, there's it doesn't seem that there's any intuitive reason for us to drop the infinite pass over dropping the Grim Reaper's paradox. And maybe there actually is a problem with the Grim Reaper's paradox, which we haven't seen yet or haven't developed yet. And and now Josh doesn't want to commit himself to discrete or dense time. And and basically they just develop what they've discussed previously, which is that in order to show that the paradox applies to infinite time, one has to demonstrate that, or one can claim that time is discrete and stop there. Like you can stop the paradox by just saying, well, if you accept that time is discrete, then perhaps you do not, you no longer have the convergent series problem. But then as a result, and as we've discussed before, you can set up the Grim Reaper's paradox, not in a convergent series set. And while all, while if you only have the convergent series, the discrete paradox would indeed work, or in, in or what I should be saying in a perhaps a better light is that, well, if you had a convergent series, it would demonstrate that time is indeed discrete. You, and it might not actually apply to an actually infinite time. You can change a paradox to demonstrate that it also applies to an infinite time as well. So, 
Josh is basically saying is that there's multiple ways you can go around doing it. Say using a convergent series is not the only way. And then and then Alex just here just summarizes Josh's argument by basically saying, well, and also develops it in a sense. He says, well, imagine that there is an eternal universe, and that's basically the eternal situation that we're left with, right? And he says, well, is it possible that there are something which is eternal? And then you could have the link, the linking proposition, or you have the, it's intuitive that if you can have an eternal universe, you could have an eternal or an eternal machine or an infinite number of machines in that universe. And if you could think of that infinite uh, number of machines, you could think about Fred, who exists infinitely. And you also have another guy called Bob, who exists infinitely. These things seem to be carrying on, or these seem to be intuitive to build on to the Grim Reaper's paradox, or build on from the original hypothesis that there is an infinite universe. And these aren't necessarily logically contradictory at the face value while you're building these hypotheses. The only problem is that when you put these all together, then you reach a contradiction. So it's like, these things or these developments don't necessarily seem to be contradictory at first, but the moment you get to the conclusion or get to somewhere down the line, you suddenly reach a contradiction which you know is wrong. And then what and then what and then what Alex says is that well now there's a bit of a problem because we've reached a contradiction which is definitely problematic. But then the everything else seems to be somewhat intuitive. Now what Alex says is that maybe the best way to go is doubt our intuition that somewhere along these lines, these these modal recombinations or these ideas, there's something wrong along these lines and that we should maybe doubt our intuition that these possible world ideas that we're developing might not be as reasonable or as reliable as possible. That although it seems at face value that there's nothing wrong with these intuitions, this chain of reasoning that you see in the Grim Reaper's Paradox, maybe there is something wrong about it in some of these scenarios because perhaps we do not fully understand the implications of modal worlds or the implications of possible worlds and by fully understanding that we would realize that there is actually some problems within it and well on the other hand Josh then responds by saying well the intuition deduces the contradiction from the hypothesis in question and there should not and there should be no tension between the intuition and the contradiction the problem arises from the infinite past and gives you a reason to deny the series the infinite series and basically what Josh is saying is that well you shouldn't really doubt this intuition because it seems very reasonable not to doubt this intuition because if we look at it from logical possibility or logical modality in a logical sense, there doesn't seem to be anything logically contradictory with all of these intuitions. And then, and then uh, Alex just strengthens his point, well, how, how reasonable or how reliable is our intuition as a guide around modality or around possible worlds? Because Although the hypothesis in the Grim Reaper's Paradox is quite reasonable, maybe our intuition is not that reliable. And then, and then in response to this is that Josh says, well, perhaps let's grant that our intuition is not too reliable. That's, let's grant that for a moment. Even if it wasn't too reasonable, or perhaps we could have a weaker sense of our intuition, if that's a better word, I mean, depending on what stronger or weaker sense, but essentially you have a weaker sense or a weaker intuition, even if it was indeed actually weaker, you could still have the case where at least it gives you some reason to doubt an infinite past, and that seems to be on a balance, assuming you have arguments for infinite past and arguments against infinite past, at least even if your intuition isn't the strongest, at least it gives you some reason to doubt infinite past, and in this side, the infinite past arguments against infinite past is strengthened. So you have this strengthening a bit, even if it's not 100%, you still have a good development, which is always very helpful. So then in, in response to this, well, Alex is saying is that, well, maybe that's right. Maybe it is seem, it, maybe it does seem quite intuitive, but if the conclusion is something or the contradiction is something quite extreme or has a lot of weight, maybe we should doubt the intuition in order to remain humble and, and not humble in the way, oh, oh you're, a, you're an arrogant guy kind of humble thing, but in a more philosophical way, like you should use the most simple, most parsimonious idea. And maybe it's not the best thing to say, well, my intuition's good enough to, to lead to great and grand results or grand ideas or conclusions from our intuition and and Josh in result of this or in response to this says well a lot of these contradictions are based on intuition and says that our intuition do is very in this sense is very useful when we look at very simple or important things like square circles because wh while it doesn't seem that a square circle is explicitly contradictory in any in very literal sense 
However, the implications or our intuition about the nature of a square and our intuition about the nature of a circle make them logically contradictory. So we can have perhaps develop another unsatisfiable pair, which is x is four sides, x is not four sides, or x is not four sides represents a circle, and x has four sides is representing the square. So while they both can't be together at the same thing, you can have them separately and true at the same time. So you could have square and circle separately, but you can't have them together. And and they kind of agree with each other on that point, although there is some disagreement in the sense that, well, actually, I would say that there, there, there's general agreement here, and I don't think we need to delve too much into any areas of disagreement because I think it, it was quite obvious that there, it, it, there, there was some implications of it, but that's discussed more later in the video. So they just say, well, Alex, just in response here in my notes, just says, in this pair, both are individually possible, not both at the same time, which is agreed by both parties. And Josh then summarizes Alex by saying, well, there is no reason to think from the Grim Reaper paradox that you can't have an infinite chain. And basically, he's saying that Alex well says that the, it doesn't follow from the Grim Reaper's paradox alone that you have you can you cannot have an infinite chain. You, and furthermore, there is some reason to think that an infinite chain is possible. And if there is this reason, then there might be reason to doubt the intuition. One has to otherwise one has to doubt has to remain maintain the intuition. What I think Josh is saying here is that well. On one side, you have the Grim Reaper hypothesis, which says into like you have the Grim Reaper on one side and and infinite series on the other side. You can't you can't really necessarily have them both together unless you want to doubt the intuition that you bring for or the connection between Grim Reapers and infinity. So basically, what you have here is that on one side you have an infinite chain, and on the other side you have the Grim Reaper's paradox. He's saying, well, if you have intuition to to, or good reason to support the hypothesis of the infinity or the infinite chain or an infinite causal series, then that would give you good reason to override your intuition on for the Grim Reaper's paradox. If you get what I'm saying, it's like you have you have two things in front of you: Grim Reaper's paradox and your infinite causal chain. Like if you have good reason to support infinite causal chain, then maybe you could support support or or suggest that your intuition for the Grim Reaper's paradox is quite unreliable. But then we all, of course, have to see the evidence or in support of the infinite chain, which unfortunately doesn't get discussed too much in our in the discussion. But it's essentially like he's asking Alex to provide some reasons for that. And and what and what Alex says is that is that if you weigh these two things together, you weigh the causal finitism and the unsatisfiable pair. It seems that the unsatisfiable pair is indeed a subset of the causal finitism in the sense that the unsatisfiable pair raised by the Grim Reaper's paradox is not the entire, or not the same thing as the causal fi uh, belief in causal finitism. In, in the other, on the other hand, or instead, it is only a subset of causal finitism. And indeed, both parties do agree with the contradiction, or the impossible, or that the contradiction uh, leads to a logical impossibility in the sense that you can't have both parts of the unsatisfiable pair. the The question only arises is that is whether the paradoxes give you sufficient to the paradoxes give you sufficient reason to believe that causal finitism is true in the sense that well is it really true that causal finitism is a conclusion from the unsatisfiable pair although the unsatisfiable pair seems to point towards or at least develop somewhat of an idea of of finite of some sense of finitism it doesn't necessarily mean causal finitism it could mean just time is discrete and other things we've discussed before but he's basically saying is that well, we need to see a more direct link, and also we need to see that the Grim Reaper paradox actually applies directly to causal finitism. Furthermore, all things being equal, the unsatisfiable pair seems to be more a simple explanation compared to causal finitism. In the sense, and that's just Occam's razor, and then the strength of the hypothesis that the strength of the hypothesis gives Alex a reason to doubt the modal epistemology in the Grim Reaper's paradox. And then and that's it's basically saying, well, there's more reason to deny or suggest it's it's more reasonable to suggest that co the causal chain is infinite than to suggest that the Grim Reaper's paradox is correct and also accept the modal implications of it. That means or the modal intuitions. So perhaps it's more reasonable for us to doubt the modal intuitions behind the Grim Reaper's paradox instead of uh, committing ourselves to causal finitism. That means the price of of causal finitism is so high that our intuitions do not or the use of our intuitions does not justify it. So you have a bit of a comparison there. 
And then basically Josh Rasmussen says, well, there's a few ways to go from this. First of all, you could slow down the recombination co and discuss more about the different modal understandings of the universe because he says that Alex finds a recombination it, uh, intuitive because even Alex, and that's something we have to note, is that Alex finds the recombination, these premises raised in the Grimmier's paradox, intuitive. And furthermore, we must explore the dialectical implications of the re recombinations, which basically says we have to explore the implications about the arguments, about like, well, what do we infer or what do we draw out from the arguments raised in, in the Grim Reaper's Paradox? And, and we should ap appreciate how intuitive these re recombinations are, which is basically saying, well, these things are, he's just stressing that these things are very intuitive and, and that they might be so intuitive themselves that denying them would just seem to be also having a weight themselves to deny them. So, so all things being equal, they, it might not be as like unbalanced as um, Alex suggests in the first place. And furthermore, there seems to be like we seem to be able to imply the law of non-contradiction in very extreme scenarios. Because basically, what Josh is saying is that well, Alex is suggesting that we should not imply our intuition to really extreme scenarios. But at the same time, things like law of con non-contradiction seem to be intuitive. And we do seem to imply the, or use or, or apply these laws of non-contradiction, these intuitive laws to a lot of situations. And the things or the intuitions that are being used in the paradox are almost as intuitive or as, if not as intuitive as the law of non-contradiction. So you have kind of a development here in the sense that, well, you also have to, you have to suggest that maybe our intuitive nature, or we constantly do use intuitive ideas to apply to different things, or, or to gain solutions or gain conclusions about very different things. So that we shouldn't say that such a process or such a methodology is completely inaccurate or anything like that. Instead, we should appreciate the our intuitive nature. And for and then Alex just says, well, perhaps we should deny classical logic and. That's basically the idea of like there are some power consistent and other forms of of di dialetheism by priests and other ideas where they give up the non contradiction and the laws of non contradiction and sometimes say that the best way to respond to paradoxes is to give up the law of non contradiction and that's a discussion by priests which I'm not going to go into here and they don't discuss too much here because that's just I think way too complicated and just kind of beside the point or or of course it's interesting but it's not key to the discussion and here he basically says is that well the only reason why Alex is doubting this idea of intuition even though the intuition is very strong is because he is weighing up uh, it uh, up against the other things at play although the intuition is very strong the other ideas and the other hypotheses seem to be just as strong or just as great so Josh here agrees that we have to weigh up these things or these intuitions against other things or these other ideas. However, if you weigh up causal finitism and causal infinitism, I'm not sure if that's even a word here, but if you have an infinite or a finite causal series, they both seem to have dramatic implications. And the reality is that it is impossible for you to side with one judgment or another, or I mean, it's impossible for you to withhold judgment. That means it's impossible to just say, oh, I don't really care, causal finitism, like causal infinitism, like whatever, like they both, you can't just say, oh, well, let's not think about it because they both have significant implications. And in reality, there could only be one or the other. So with that in mind, it seems that when you have these things at face value or at or if they they seem to be at face value, sim similar in their weight or their in their implication, it seems just reasonable for us to just say, well, let's go from a uh, kind of a blank slate or tabula rasa, and just say, well, from that, let's see where we can go, or from that, let's see which ones are better. And from and with that in mind, it seems our intuition for the Grim Reaper's paradox seems quite strong, and. And furthermore, he just says, well, these modal recombinations that we see in the Grim Reaper's Paradox are just as clear as the law of non-contradiction. They don't have to be very clear, but they are sufficient to provide good reason to choose one over the other in the sense that, and that just goes back to the previous discussion, it doesn't really matter how strong the thing is per se, it just has to be a sufficient idea to give you good reason to doubt the causal infinitism and if you have one which has, has way more reasoning against than you have reasoning for then at least you have good reason or you should reasonably hold one view over the other even if you don't have 100% certainty because at the end of the day you can never have 100% certainty because there will be a small problem of skepticism at the back of the mind 
And then they next go on to discuss, well, are these recombinations as clear as they are? Can, can some, can an, and then they go to the suggestion and they talk more about the blue or red object, which is basically the idea of the modal recombinations. Is it really intuitively true of whether you could possibly have one set of universe or another set of hypotheses? And that's basically saying, well, is it metaphysically or logically possible to have these certain issues? And they have quite a long discussion over this. And if you want to just just go check my WordPress account out if you want to do so. Just read my account, you could go check that out. But I'll, I'll just skip on a bit later when they discuss logical and metaphysical impossibility and possibility, because I think that's a more interesting place where they discuss and that would get us through the discussion a bit faster. I think my camera's running out of time, so I'll stop the recording and then I'll start recording again. So I'll see you in a bit. Okay, I'm back. I uploaded and fixed all the storage issues on my camera. So essentially, let us now talk about the metaphysical and the logical contradiction or the logical impossibilities that they've discussed in this video. So essentially, what they were trying to say in this discussion is that there was a difference between the metaphysical possibility and the logical possibility. While they both agreed that the logical possibility, and actually they agreed with most of the things when it comes to here, it just basically saying that well, logical impossibility leads to metaphysical impossibility, whereas, on the other hand, metaphysical possibility, at the very least, implies logical possibility as well. So you see, like, everything which is logically possible may not be metaphysically possible. However, everything which is metaphysically possible is perhaps logically possible. So they essentially agree a lot here, and I wouldn't discuss too much, but the true discussion or the true problems which come up here is not on the logical ground per se, but whether we should be discussing the matter on a metaphysical ground. And what they're basically saying is that on one side you have, should we discuss philosophy on, uh, should we be discussing the Grim Reaper's paradox in relationship or as a metaphysical problem or as a logical problem? On one hand, Josh Rasmussen is saying that logical problem or the Grim Reaper's paradox is a logical problem, whereas Alex is suggesting that it is indeed a metaphysical problem and the reason why he suggests that it is a logical problem or uh, Josh suggests that it's a logical problem is because the po the mode of possibilities or the modality that they're talking about is logically possible. It doesn't matter whether it's, log it's metaphysically possible of for there to be uh, these mechanisms or for there to be these Grim Reaper kind of things, right? He's just saying, is it logically possible that these things lie or these things exist? And if it is logically possible that these things can exist or these conditions work, then it follows that the conclusion is all right as well. But then the problem is, is that the conclusion leads to contradiction and hence we can demonstrate that the Grim Reaper scenario is a logical contradiction instead of just um, a logic or just a metaphysical problem. So, so there's this a bit of a discussion here, and and here's I think where it gets interesting here. I'm just reading through my notes as I'm as I'm as I'm speaking right now. But it's basically they they're discussing between what it means to be metaphysically possible and what it means to be logically possible. And here, what Alex is saying is, or he's trying to develop, is his own metaphysical idea or his own idea of modality which is basically a branching theory of modality and what his branching theory of modality is 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 quite similar to Graham Opie's theory of modality is that these metaphysical possibilities aren't just imagine another world imagine another world it's like well imagine our world and what are the possible indeterminate choices which come up from our world are the other metaphysical worlds so instead of saying well there's a million different metaphysical possibilities of what I'm going to do next it's like the metaphysical possibility is only like, should I pick up this, pick up this uh, remote control? And if I don't, then I haven't picked it up. And then there's those two uh, metaphysical possibilities. So it's a branching off of the original reality. And if the original reality is something, then it follows that you can't get the contradiction somewhere down the line. For example, if you if you start off with the argument with an infinite past, then it, it seems weird to just follow and then suddenly say, well, you get a contradiction from the place you start off with or the thing you branched off from, because then that just leads to a bit of a problem or a further problem with the discussion. So this does not only apply to the ball hypothesis and their discussion a bit about the balls, but it applies to literally everything as well. Like you cannot create a contradiction. This is what Joe adds. He's uh, giving some commentary is that he's basically saying that this branching theory of modality or metaphysical possibility applies to any step of an eternal past. It doesn't just mean it applies to any specific scenarios like the Grim Reaper or anything. It applies to all different uh, worlds of of past or the past. So 
So from that, it seems that if the past was indeed eternal, you cannot derive a contradiction from that. But then uh, there's two things that Josh wants to talk about. And, and essentially he says, well, although, and he says that if you can block the intuition at the first step, then you can figure out, or you could realize a problem with the whole argument. And what he's saying is that if you can demonstrate that there, these things are impossible at the first place, then you could perhaps see where the, the problem arises from. And if one grants Alex's modal theory of reality and combines it with the Grim Reaper's paradox, then it takes, then it takes you down a path with significant consequences. And he's basically saying is that, well, you could give up now you, now that now let's assume you grant Alex's form of modal reality or metaphysical uh, possibility, grant the the unsatisfiable pair and grant the infinite past, you soon reach very extreme conclusions or it leads, it commits you to a lot of different ideas and which it makes it seem that it's more reasonable to doubt such a world than to doubt your intuition. So once again, it's the balancing of worldview. If you think about the, what Alex is presenting and his the the how do you say the accumulation or the or the totality of the worldview that Alex is presenting of the finite past, the the infinite past, and all these different things put together, it seems at face value more complicated than just accepting the Grim Reaper and from accepting your intuition. And hence, it's more reasonable to doubt the infinite past than to doubt your intuition. So they basically continue to talk a bit more about these different ideas between the logical impossibility and the and the metaphysical possibility. And they also talk a bit more about how the finite and the infinite kind of relate to each other. But but basically I'd like to pick up on the final point that, or just just go skip past that if you want to discuss, look at more of that discussion, check it below. But I don't think it's too important for the summary of this debate or this discussion. But essentially they, I, I would like to bring it back later on in the video when they go, well, when they kind of discuss that, it what the problem with the Grim Reaper's paradox is that we do not have a definite part of where we know it actually goes wrong or where the contradiction actually arises from, apart from the very end where the contradiction suddenly arises from. It's like you have a lot of these hypotheses which all seem to be logically possible, but then you suddenly arrive at a logically impossible conclusion and there's not a single one which you could say, ah, that's exactly where the logical contradiction comes from. And, and the fact that by you could have logical possibilities by just pulling out random logical possibilities and putting them together, it, it seems that we, it's not too of a definitive, a definitive case, and it's not a very strong case. If you look at the Grim Reaper's paradox, because because logical possibility is only black and white. Whereas if you really want to discuss about the time being finite and infinite, infinite, it's better to go around with metaphysical possibilities because it's more clear, and you could really, and it will help us differentiate or decipher where exactly is the problem arising in the Grim Reaper's paradox. And in response to that, Josh basically says that things like a square circle are indeed not explicitly contradictory, and that's basically what he rose before, and that's the idea that, well, maybe explicitly we do not see exactly what's contradictory with each other during the thing, or or how we get these things, but then that doesn't really matter too much because we do have a linking principle, and it, by developing this linking principle, we can demonstrate that two things are contradictory, even if though even if they're not intuit, I mean, explicitly contradictory. They, by using your intuition, you can demonstrate that they're contradictory by adding certain of these possible worlds or these possible hypotheses and develop the world or develop the idea from that. Furthermore, he summarizes Alex's objections, which basically says that the Grim Reaper paradox seems possible and intuitive. And that's the idea that Alex actually seems throughout the discussion to suggest that these hypotheses of the Grim Reaper are indeed possible and intuitive. But the only problem rises is because it, the result of the Grim Reaper is contradictory and not because of any problem with the argument itself or not at least not any clear, clear problem of the argument itself or at least there's not a clear definite part of the argument itself which uh, Alex doesn't agree with. And I, I'm sorry, I have this very itchy thing on the side of my face. I'm not sure why I have it, but essentially it's the linking principle and then, and then Alex responds by saying that you can, that it's a bit of a difference here. The 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 linking principle in both, in both places are quite different. Like, the circle definition, the way that works, is quite different from the case of the Grim Reaper. And and Josh, in that sense, would also agree with it. Like, they are different principles in the Grim Reaper. But the problem is that the analogy isn't really a result or a discussion mainly on the principle, but instead that of the use of the principle, uh, of any principle itself, is that via use of a principle, you can deduce a contradiction. And they probably, furthermore, they and they further actually quite agree with each other here. But it's basically like, 
Alex, on one hand, doesn't seem to see, and this is what Josh says, that maybe Alex doesn't see the similarity because a square circle seems logically impossible, whereas an infinite pass seems possible. And basically what they're saying is that, well, where are our starting points? To Josh, maybe an infinite pass seems at the as impossible as a square circle, or perhaps they, they both entail a similar sense of logical impossibility, whereas Alex sees one as a more metaphysical possibility and the other one as uh, logical impossibility. So there's perhaps a different starting point from both sides, which leads to a bit of disagreement. And we're getting towards the end of it. I, I know I've kind of sped up towards the end of this end of this discussion, but it's because I think a lot of themes are are recurring in different forms, and I think it's very interesting to note it, but I, I, I don't want to go into too much depth here because the video is just going to be way too long. But let's just get over or finish this video. So it's essentially it's saying, well, it seems easier to come to the conclusion that the past is infinite if all things are equal. And that's basically what Alex is saying. And that's uh, once again going back to the starting point is that he, on, from his starting point or from his perspective, it's easier to start off if the past was infinite and if if all things are equal, the past being infinite seems to be more parsimonious. And basically, Alex and then they discuss more about Konigsberg Bridge or something like that. And and I don't, I'm not going to discuss it here because I think it goes a bit too much and also refers to some other debates and and some other things which I'm not really interested in going into this video. So I'll skip past that. But basically, in response to this, is that well, and I can't even read my own writing here on my notes. That's a bit embarrassing. And then basically the argument kind of ends or discussion kind of ends because they both kind of run out of time. But essentially what they're saying is that, well, what Josh seems to see the problem is now that, and is that, well, Alex is saying the, if you, the Green Reaper works against a convergent finite uh, convergent series of time, it seems that there's problems with both the infinite series of time and a finite series of time. So there's problems in both situations. And that can't be true because time is either infinite or finite. And if, and if the Grim Reaper's paradox demonstrates that both time is is cannot be infinite and cannot be finite, and of course it cannot be finite if you take time is as dense and as and as a convergent series like the Grim Reaper, the traditional Grim Reaper paradox, then there is a problem because you can't have time both not becoming finite and not being finite at the same time as a paradox or the conclusion of a paradox. There must be something wrong with your paradox. And then in the end of the and in the, at the end to summarize this video or summarize the debate, Josh just basically says, well. What what is actually happening is that we're not talking about time per se, but more of an infinite chain. And of course, infinite chain is significantly relating to time. But if you take time as discrete, then or any or any view of time, as long as you could demonstrate that infinite chains are impossible, then at least at the bare minimum, you can rule out infinite time by demonstrating that there cannot be an infinite number of causal chains. So I think that summarizes the video quite well. I'm not going to give much thoughts about it because I think it was a very good apart from the fact that I really love discussions, it's a very interesting thing. I spent my entire morning watching and making notes about it. So if you enjoy this kind of format, this kind of review, then feel free to like and subscribe. It means a lot to me. It really helps this channel grow. Any feedback, once again, drop it in the comments below or drop it in the Discord server, which will be in the link below as well. If you want to watch the entire debate, go check out the debate, which would be in the link below. Check out Majesty of Reason, his channel, Joe Schmidt, really great guy. Seems amazing. Only thing he's an Arsenal fan, but whatever. It's all good. If you want to check my notes out, I have to admit my handwriting isn't too good. You could check out my WordPress account, Apologetics for All. I'll put the link to that blog post in the description below as well. And basically, everything is in the description below. So, and furthermore, finally, to wrap this off, if you want to get a purchase of my book, Christianity for All, make sure you check it out in the link below. Buy it from Book Depository and not Kindle is cheaper, especially if you're living in Hong Kong, so you don't need to pay the shipping fee, which is almost the same price as the book, Book Depository. Although the book itself is around 10 Hong Kong dollars more or around one US dollar more, it is cheaper to just buy it on Book Depository. It's just cheaper for you because there is no shipping. So, have a great day, stay safe, like always, if you have any comment, any feedback, let me know. And also, if you want to support this channel, make sure you like and subscribe. It means a lot to me, helps this channel grow. So, have a great one, stay safe, God bless, and goodbye. See you in the next one.